All right, everyone, uh, let's uh, pick up where we left off in our last lecture. Um, remember, we were covering chapter 10, and chapter 10, um, the topics are acids and bases. And so we already had point uh, part one of the acids and base chapter. Let's move on to part two. Um, uh, enjoying my coffee, you'll get a kick out of the, the cup. Chemists, all right, have to have chemistry labware for their coffee, all right. So let's move, let's move on. In this second part of our discussion of acids and bases, we begin with the topics of ionization of water and pH. So let's begin with the ionization of water. In water, so imagine that you have a beaker filled with water. You know the formula of water, H2O, two hydrogen atoms covalently bonded to an oxygen atom. If you just have a sample of water, the hydrogen protons, the protons, are transferred from one water molecule to another. For instance, let's imagine, let's just imagine we are focusing in on two molecules of water. So here's our first one. And now we have a second one. Okay. So what happens is that a proton is transferred from one water molecule to the other. So one donates the proton and one of those water molecules accepts it. So one acts as the acid, one acts as the base. And we end up with hydronium ion, our good friend that we were introduced to in, in part one, and the hydroxide ion. Just to show you uh, in a little bit more detail, this proton transfer. Let's look at the Lewis dot structures for these water molecules. Okay, so here you see the oxygen, right? And it's uh, covalently bonded, so our sharing of two electrons to the hydrogen. Here's another one. Sorry, that's as close as I could get them. Um, and here are our two lone pairs of one. Okay, so here's the other. So remember what we said happens. One of these uh, waters donates a proton. So let's follow this one, this marked proton here in this water molecule. This is going to get donated to this water molecule. Whoops, way over here. Okay, hands not working good right now. All right, there we go. Got a little bit more support. And... Um, <clears throat> when it gets transferred, we end up with hydronium ion and then hydroxide ion. So notice the arrow that I'm using here. It's that double-headed arrow. So we know double-headed arrows mean that, um, yeah, we're not getting too much of what's on this side here. Okay, Mostly we've got over uh, what's over on this side. Okay, it goes back and forth. Um, so one water molecule, as we said, is acting as the acid, right? And the other one acts as the base. One is donating, so this is the acid. One is accepting the proton, so this is the base. All right, so water and water, right, gives us hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. All right, more on this ionization of water. If we have pure water, that means water with absolutely nothing else in it, so it wouldn't be out of the tap, it would be distilled, can't have anything else in it. The ionization of the water molecules, as we saw on the last slide, produces small 
but equal amounts of those hydronium ions and those hydroxide ions. So let's show you using a pictorial. All right, so again, pure water. Can't be tap water because tap water isn't pure. It's got some, um, some ions in it. All right, so this is just pure water. So the water, one will act as an acid, another as a base, and we'll end up with hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. And as the pictorial shows you, you're going to end up with equal amounts. They're small, small quantities, but they are equal amounts. So these brackets here around the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion, those indicate concentrations. So what we're saying here is that the concentration of um, hydronium ion and hydroxide ion in pure water are equal. And so we end up with a neutral solution. Okay, when they're equal, we've got a neutral solution. All right, remember what the definition of an acid was and the definition of a base. We don't have that. Okay, um, molar concentrations again, this is what we said. These are molar concentrations are indicated by the brackets around the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion. Okay, so neutral solution, right? when the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion concentrations are the same, they're equal. Well, how about acidic solutions? When we add acid to that pure water, remember the pure water has um, an equal concentration of hydronium and hydroxide ions. What does the acid do? What's the definition, right? When you put an acid in water, according to Arrhenius, right, we produce protons, hydrogen ions, right, or which react with the water and give us hydronium ions. So adding an acid to pure water increases the concentration of hydronium ions and decreases the concentration of hydroxide ions. So let's do the same thing. Let's do a pictorial for an acid solution. Okay. When we add acid to pure water, we now have an acidic solution. The concentration of hydronium ion goes up. Okay, it's much higher. Look, there's the concentration. Okay, uh, because we've added H plus to the water, as an acid does. And as that goes up, the concentration of hydroxide ion goes down. So characteristic of acidic solutions, the concentration of hydronium ion is greater. Notice it's greater than the hydroxide ion. All right, have a basic solutions. Again, go back to your definitions. You must know your definitions. When we talk about a basic solution, that has to ring a bell. Okay, according to Arrhenius, what happens? What's a basic solution? Um, when placed in water, it's a substance that produces hydroxide ions in solution. So if we were to add a base to pure water, and again, think back to what we have with pure water. We have an equal concentration of hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. Well, now we're going to add a substance that increases the hydroxide ion concentration. So adding base to pure water is going to increase the hydroxide ion concentration. And if that increases, then the hydronium ion concentration decreases. Again, a picture is worth a, a thousand words, right? Is that what they say, right? Um, so here we go in a basic solution. What happens, right? It's adding hydroxide ions. So the hydroxide ion concentration goes up and the hydronium ion concentration goes down. In a basic solution, the hydronium ion concentration is less than, notice the sign there, the hydroxide ion concentration. All right, so let's put it all together here in this last slide um, comparison of the concentrations of hydronium ion and hydroxide ion in a neutral solution. 
So that would be pure water. So here's our neutral solution. What's the characteristic of a neutral solution? Concentration of hydronium ion is equal to the concentration of hydroxide ion. It's a small amount, okay, um, but they are in fact equal. When we add acid, think of the definition of an acid, right? We're adding H plus hydronium ion to the solution, so the concentration of hydronium ion is greater than the concentration of hydroxide ion. And for a basic solution, again, think of the definition. What is a base doing? It's increasing the concentration of hydroxide ion. And if that increases, then the hydronium ion concentration goes down. So in a basic solution, hydronium ion concentration is less than the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay. This brings us right into our next topic, pH. The pH of a solution, we often talk about it. It is used to indicate the acidity of a solution. pH values range um, usually from 0 to 14. When the pH value is less than 7, then that indicates that you have an acidic solution. If your pH is exactly at 7, well, we say it's neutral. Right? So pH of 7 indicates a neutral solution. Neutral solution, remember, you have an equal concentration of hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. And a basic solution, how do we know? Well, the pH values are greater than 7. So I put here on this slide some pH values of everyday solutions, things that you uh, might be familiar with. Okay, and so here we have our scale, all right? Um, from 0 to 14, we said, usually, okay? And at 7, we're talking neutral, right? So who's at 7? Pure water, okay? Drinking water, remember, is, is not pure. It has things added to it. So its pH is just ever so slightly um, on the basic side, okay? It's almost neutral. Blood, 7.4. It's not neutral. It's almost okay just slightly ever so slightly basic okay bile and detergents basic all right seawater not surprising right with all the salts in there um 8.5 milk of magnesia 10.5 ammonia we know that is a base all right it's a weak base but it is a base uh, at 11 bleach Okay, how many of you know that bleach is basic, right? And then uh, sodium hydroxide, lye, right? Your Drano, okay? There it is at 14. So it is extremely caustic, as we say. Very, very basic, right? Over on the other side of the scale, the uh, less than 7, so acidic urine coming in at 6, Potato, 5.8, uh, I believe that's soil at 5, bread, 5, coffee, right? You've all heard that coffee is acidic. Some people, it, it bothers their stomach. Um, not super acidic, but um, it is uh, acidic, slightly acidic at 5. Tomatoes, apple juice, carbonated beverages, okay, oranges, okay, with their ascorbic acid in their vinegar, lemon juice, gastric juice, all right, that does your digestion, 1.6, and way, way down there, uh, one molar HCl coming in right at zero, okay? So what should you be able to do? Well, you got to know the scale, know who's neutral, know uh, what pH indicates acidity, what pH indicates basicity. Make sure 
that you can identify a solution um, as acidic or basic based upon the pH that you are given. Okay, uh, again, practice problems in the book. That's the only way that you learn. Okay? If you're only listening to this, this PowerPoint and that's it, all right, it's not enough. You have to treat these PowerPoints where I'm talking to you just as I'm talking to you in class. You need to take notes. You need to study the notes. You need to read the text and do the problems. That's the only way to master chemistry. All right. So, well, you might wonder, well, how do we test pH? How do we get all these values? Uh, there's a variety of different ways. The pH of solutions can be determined by using um, a pH meter. This is the absolute best way to determine the pH. A uh, pH meter looks as uh, like this. Okay. Um, remember uh, that solutions, right, um, acids and bases, right, um, are electrolytes. So what they do is they conduct electricity and that is read and converted into the pH. Another way, um, not quite so accurate, is to use pH paper before we um, went on uh, a lot online teaching, maybe in the lab, you might have used pH paper. pH paper can be very simple, it can be just red and, and blue, which test very quickly. Do I have an acid? Do I have a base? Or it can be um, the multicolor test paper that can give you uh, different pH ranges. And the last type are to use indicators. Indicators that have specific colors at different pH values. Okay. So when you add a, uh, a little bit of the indicator or the solution to an indicator, um, it will tell you based upon the color um, exactly what pH you have or what pH range you have. All right, but the absolute best way, right here, the pH meter. Okay. All right. Next topic in our chapter 10, we move on to reactions of acids and bases. There are a handful of reactions uh, that you need to be familiar with. All right, the very first one, reactions of acids with metals. So you all know on the periodic table from early in the semester where the metals are and you know who the metals are. Acids react with metals. The most common metals that acids react with are potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, zinc, iron, and tin. When the acids react with a metal, they produce hydrogen gas, right? So you're going to get two products. You're always going to get hydrogen gas. And the second one is a salt of the metal. Okay, so salt, you're thinking things like sodium chloride. Okay, sodium chloride, remember, is a salt. So it's a metal and a non-metal. Okay, so let's take this information and look at an example. All right, we're going to look at the molecular equations for reaction of some acids with metals. In every single one, we're going to get hydrogen gas, and then we're going to get the salt of the metal. All right, so a molecular equation, what does that mean? Well, it's showing you everything, okay, everything, okay? So let's, uh, let's use our, our potassium metal, okay? Potassium metal is a solid, and let's react it with um, hydrochloric acid, all right? So we're going to call this hydrochloric acid and not hydrogen chloride because look at that it is in water aq okay so what comes behind the um the formula tells us whether or not something with a proton all right like this is we're going to name it as an acid or whether we're going to name it 
using our normal naming that we learned early on. Okay, so when they react, so it's a metal and an acid, and what did we say? We're going to get hydrogen gas. So that's an easy one. Okay, I should have put that one first. Okay, so let's let's write it out. So here it is. We're going to get hydrogen gas. So good thing to write that first. Okay, and once we take the hydrogen out of the equation, okay, what are we left with? We're left with potassium and chlorine. So that's what you're going to make your salt of the metal out of. All right, using your charges, potassium group one plus one. Chlorine, group 7, negative 1. So it's KCl is the formula, right? Salts um, are water soluble, so it's going to be aqueous. And then we come through, as we learned in our chapter 7 in the beginning, and we balance our equation. We make sure that we have the same number of each kind of atom um, on both sides of the equation. Okay, so there is an example of a molecular equation. All right, so let's do one with zinc. All right, so this is another common um, metal that reacts with acids. And again, let's use our uh, our hydrochloric acid. That's a go-to acid. You'll see it used a lot of times, okay? And so when it reacts, we are going to end up with hydrogen. And again, I don't think I put it first, but we should. All right, so let's skip on over to it. Okay, so here's our hydrogen. We're taking it out of commission here. Okay, and what do we have left? We have zinc and chlorine. So we're thinking about the charges, right? Okay, and zinc is a plus two. And our chlorine is a negative one. So ZnCl2, and again, these coefficients, these numbers out front, right? So there's a 1 there, 2, there's a 1 here, there's a 1 here. Um, those are balancing the equation, making sure we put those in there so that we have the same number of each kind of atom on both sides of the equation. If you don't remember how to do that, you go back to the beginning of Chapter 7. Okay, all right, so molecular equations again show you everything. Okay, so that was our first type of reaction of acids. Our second type reaction of acids with carbonates. It turns out that reactions, re, or I'm sorry, acids react with carbonates and hydrogen carbonates. And when an acid reacts with uh, carbonates and hydrogen carbonates, you get three products every single time. So this makes it real easy. You get carbon dioxide gas. What's that? CO2, right? A salt, okay? And water. Let's check it out, all right? And uh, when we're looking at these examples here, um, keep in mind that when we're done going through it, you need to make sure that you can write the products of reactions of acids and metals, as we did on the previous slide. And also, you're going to need to make sure that you can um, write the reactions for uh, acids with carbonates and hydrogen carbonates, just as we're going to do here. Okay. All right. So let's take an acid. Let's take our go-to uh, hydrochloric acid. And again, these are molecular equations. Okay. So they're going to show everything. All right. Everything. And let's use calcium carbonate. Okay. So calcium carbonate. You might wonder, where am I getting these names from? You should know them. Right. We covered naming in previous chapters. And again, this is hydrochloric acid. How do we know? Because of that little AQ behind there, right? Mm -hmm. It's in water, right? Okay. Um, so we have an acid and we have a carbonate, not a hydrogen carbonate, a carbonate. What are we going to get? What did we say? When an acid reacts with a carbonate, we're going to get three things. We're going to get carbon dioxide gas. There it is. We're going to get a salt. Let's 
come back to this and water. So the first things you're going to write down are your carbon dioxide and your water. Okay. And once you take those out of commission, right, you're then going to draw your salt. A salt has a metal and a non-metal. So find your metal. Here it is, calcium. And here's your non-metal, okay, your chloride using your um, charges, right, of ions, plus two, minus one, you're writing the correct formula. This is earlier chapter stuff, okay? That er Those earlier chapters where we learned how to write formulas for compounds, ionic and molecular, such as these, all right? If you have not mastered it, you're not going to have a very strong base Okay, and your um, your chemistry pyramid is going to begin to crumble. All right, so I'll go back and review. Okay, if you don't know, go back and review and master it. All right, let's do another example. Let's take again hydrochloric acid, and let's do a hydrogen carbonate. All right, or a bicarbonate as it's uh, sometimes called. Okay, so this is sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium bicarbonate. Okay, and again, this is hydrochloric acid. How? Because the AQ there is, we're naming it, okay, as um, hydrochloric acid. When we react these, okay, as we set up here, acids react with hydrogen carbonates to give, what, three things. We're going to get carbon dioxide, water, and a salt. Okay. So carbon dioxide, that's easy, right? Let's see if we can pick out our salt, right? So here is our metal. Here is our non-metal, okay? Salt, right? It wouldn't make sense to have this, right? When, right? Well, that wouldn't be a reaction. Okay, so it's those two. There it is. So it's sodium chloride and our water and again you go through and you make sure that you have balanced the equation make sure you have the same number of uh, atoms on both sides of the equation okay all right so we've done molecular equations for the reactions of acids with carbonates both carbonates and hydrogen carbonates practice okay as I said you're going to need to be able to write the products of these reactions of acids with metals as we did on the previous slide and with carbonates and hydrogen carbonates as we have just done all right our third type of reactions that you're responsible for are the neutralization reactions in a neutralization reaction an acid such as Hydrochloric acid, that's our goal to acid, reacts with a base such as sodium hydroxide. Okay, so those are going to be our examples. Of course, it could be any acid and any base. Okay, but this is going to be your example to fall back on. All right, so you need to recall some things that we talked about earlier in part one. When we have hydrochloric acid, right? and it is in water okay hcl we mix it in water recall what happens they react right our hcl donates a proton and our water acts as the base and accepts the proton so we end up with hydronium ion and chloride ion okay so what else did we say? We're going to take this HCl um, and we're going to mix it with sodium hydroxide. So the HCl, right, this is what we have, right? It's a strong acid, which means 100% ionization. We don't have any more of the HCl around. We have hydronium ion and chloride ion, okay? And this is going to do absolutely nothing. Remember, it is a weak base, okay? And our sodium hydroxide, it's a strong base, so when we place this strong base in water, recall that it 
ionizes a hundred percent and we end up with sodium ion in solution right and hydroxide ion in solution so these are the entities that we have we don't have our HCl and or our sodium hydroxide anymore okay all right so what happens we end up seeing a reaction between the hydronium ion here Ooh, that's awful okay I need a larger desk here so I can support my hand okay so the hydronium ion which is up here okay from the acid reacts with oh well look at that I sort of linked the two there we go with the hydroxide ion from the base okay and when they react there it is okay we end up with water okay so the hydronium ion from uh, the reaction of our acid with water reacts with the hydroxide ion that came from the dissociation of the base okay and we get water okay all right with that in mind let's look at some more reactions okay so in the equation for a neutralization okay, what are we going to write well the products are going to be a salt and water as we just saw so an acid reacts with a base and when they react the products of a neutralization reaction are a salt and water and we just saw how the water forms all right so let's write a full molecular equation for a neutralization reaction let's use our HCl and let's use our sodium hydroxide okay so our acid we recognize and a base aha this is going to be a neutralization reaction we say what do we get on the other side well we know one of the products is water all right so water is coming from the OH and the H plus so the only thing left that could form our salt right salts have a metal and a non-metal right so there it is NaCl is our salt and water okay always an acid base neutralization reaction gives you a salt and water let's do another okay let's again use HCl as our acid hydrochloric acid and let's use another strong base let's use calcium hydroxide okay why CaOH2 you ask well calcium has a plus two charge right hydroxide minus one so there are two of them all right so uh, reaction of an acid and a base mm -hmm. what are we going to get well we're going to get water and the water we saw is going to come from these OHs right and the hydrogen so they are out of commission we need to figure out who is going to give us our salt the salt uh, metal and a non-metal there we go it's going to be calcium chloride and again we're going to use our charges to help us draw the correct formula there it is um, CaCl2 and as we said water and again our coefficients are there why because they balance the equation all right all right so um, let's just run through let's give you some steps that are going to be helpful for you uh, as you do problems in the textbook regarding balancing neutralization equations okay four-step process step one all right write the reactants and the products step two balance the hydrogens in the acid and the hydroxide in the base 
Step three, balance the water with the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide ion. And last step, write the salt from your remaining ions. Okay, so I'm going to do something here. Step one, let's just start with writing. I'm going to take something out here. Okay, you're going to write the reactants. Okay, start with the reactants first. Okay, and then we'll go through and and balance. Okay, and then lastly, last step, we'll we'll write that salt. Okay, so let's do an example. Okay, example. I use those four steps. Okay, so here is the uh, the question that you have been asked. Right, write the balanced equation for the neutralization of magnesium hydroxide and nitric acid. All right. Ooh, ooh. We really need to have mastered our um, our formulas, right, from the earlier chapter and names of acids, okay, and their formulas. If you haven't, you need to go back and do that, okay? All right, step one, um, write the acid and the base, so the reactants, okay? All right. So again, if you don't know how to write the formula for magnesium hydroxide, go back to the earlier chapters. Okay, so Mg, right, plus two charge from its position in the table, hydroxide, OH minus, formula Mg, OH2. You need those parentheses, right, and the two is a subscript, okay, because it's the whole thing taken twice. Okie doke. And who's it reacting with? Nitric acid. Remember the naming, the IC acid, right? Okay, that's the nitrate, the NO3 uh, plus or negative minus, right? Polyatomic uh, coupled with a hydrogen. All right, step one done. Step two, we're going to balance the H plus in the acid. So here's the H plus in the acid right here. Okay. Um, let's underline it, right? And the OH minus in the base. All right. So what does that mean? Well, we've got, if you notice here, we have two hydrogens and we only have one here. Okay, so we have to balance that hydrogen. So we're going to um, take and put a two in front of the hydrogen on our acid to make sure that now uh, they're balanced. Okay, so we balance the hydrogen. Right, step three, balance with water. Okay, remember one of our products is water. Okay. So let's take what we have, all right? We have MgOH2, and we have two uh, HNO3s, two nitric acids, okay? So water, H2O, all right? On the other side, we're going to get a salt. We'll put it in later, okay? That's the last step, all right? Notice we have... Two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here for a total of four, All right? And we have two oxygens. So we write the formula for water, H2O, right? And we make sure we put a two in front of there. So that means we have four hydrogens. That's what we said we had, two here, two there. That's four. And then we have two oxygens. So Two in front of that oxygen means two, so we're balanced. Okay, so we've balanced our uh, water, right? Step four, the last thing to do is to figure out who our salt is from the remaining ions. Okay, so who are our remaining ions? Well, it's a metal, and it's either um, a non-metal or a polyatomic, right? Since our, our acid was one of those with a polyatomic, our salt comes from the metal and the polyatomic. 
All right, and again, we have to use our rules, our charges for coming up with the formula. All right, so let's write the whole thing. We had magnesium hydroxide and our nitric acid react to give us salt is going to be magnesium nitrate mg because it's a plus two charge and remember our nitrate is a minus one so we need two of them to balance okay there we have it all right four step process in order to balance a neutralization reaction make sure you practice all right just watching me do one isn't going to give you the mastery you need to be able to do an exam okay all righty our last topic of this chapter we move to buffers and we're going to begin here our talk of buffers uh, by looking at pH meters remember we talked about pH meters pH meters um, are what we use to get a very accurate pH of a solution. All right, so we begin up here at the top, okay, right here, and we notice the electrode of the pH meter is in a, what does it say, a water solution, okay, all right, and so pure water, okay, pH of 7 we assume is pure water because we said pure water has a neutral pH, pH of 7, all right, so remember what we said happens to that neutral solution when we add acid. So the pink here, right? We're going to add acid H3O plus. When we add acid, right, our hydrogen ion concentration goes up and our pH goes down. Okay, so pH of 4, acidic, right? Okay, let's take that same solution. Let's start again with a neutral water solution. And this time we're adding base. Think back to what happens when we add base. The hydroxide ion concentration goes up, right? Concentration of hydroxide increases. We have a basic solution. What's a pH of a basic solution? Well, it's greater than seven. And note what the pH is, 10.5. We have a basic solution. Okay? All right, so that's what happens when we add either acid or base to pure water. Okay? Add acid, we're going to get an acidic solution. Add base, we get a basic solution. All right. Whoops, 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 whoops. Cool back there ah, all right let's just come up here okay when an acid or base is added to water the pH changes drastically fair to say all right okay down at the bottom here let's see what we have we have hmm we have a buffer okay something called a buffer right and this buffer has a pH of 7 just like the water had a pH of 7 so it's neutral Let's see what happens when we add acid to our buffer. Same as we did up here. Hmm. pH of 6.9. Well, that's almost 7. All right, we can round it. It's pretty darn near 7. For all intents and purposes, we can call it 7. Hasn't changed. Okay. If we add base to that buffer, my oh my. All right. It's still staying around 7, 7.1. So what we're seeing here, when an acid or a base is added to a buffer solution, the pH is being maintained. The pH does not change. Very interesting phenomena. Let's see why. Let's look in more detail at these buffers. So, buffers, what are they? Well, they're solutions that resist changes in pH from the addition of either acid or base. That's what we saw on the previous slide. Our body has buffers 
in the body, what the buffers do is they absorb uh, hydronium ion or hydroxide ion from our foods and from uh, being produced in cellular processes. And they do this in order to maintain the body's pH. They are critical. They're super important in the proper functioning of cells and the blood. Right? We don't want wild fluctuations in the pH right, of our blood. In the blood, buffers maintain a pH, as we saw on our chart earlier, close to 7.4. So it's ever so slightly basic. All right. Um, a change in the pH of blood affects the uptake of oxygen and thus the cellular processes. So that's why it is so critical to have the buffers in the blood maintaining that pH. And you can read in the textbook, the textbook has some really good explanations of what happens um, if that uh, pH is not maintained. All right, so how does a buffer do this? How does a buffer uh, maintain the pH even when you're adding concentrated acid or concentrating base? A buffer solution, it turns out, contains a combination of, here's something we studied in part one, acid-base conjugate pairs. So if you don't understand that concept of acid-base conjugate pairs, you need to go back and master that. Okay. So acid-base conjugate pairs. Who are acid-base conjugate pairs usually in a buffer? A buffer may contain a weak acid. Right? You know who the weak acids are, right? They're everything else other than those six strong acids. All right. So a buffer solution may contain a weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base. So take any weak acid. Okay, write its conjugate base and make it into a salt. That means couple it with a metal ion. Typically, we see that a buffer has equal concentrations of the uh, weak acid and its salt. All right, sometimes not, but usually it has um, equal concentrations of those two things. And sometimes we see buffers that contain a weak base and a salt of that weak base's conjugate acid. Okay, so you want to be on the lookout, all right? A weak base, you know who the weak bases are, right? Okay, and a salt of its conjugate acid. So again, this is why you need to understand those conjugate acid base pairs. Okay, so those are the components of a buffer. Why? Why do we have those components? How does that make the buffer work? Let's look at the action of a buffer, all right, and how those components uh, help uh, achieve what we saw in that first slide. All right, no change in the pH. All right, let's take um, for our example buffer. All right to show you about buffer action let's use um, an acetic acid acetate buffer okay so acetic acid with acetic acid acetate buffer we have then acetic acid all right acetic acid ch3cooh and sodium acetate, okay? The salt, right? The sodium salt of the conjugate base, right? That's what we said we have. So here we have our weak acid 
and we have the conjugate base salt, okay, sodium salt. The salt, let's think about these two things, right? These are in combination in water. So let's think about what we have seen through the last couple of chapters. Salts, sodium salts, they're water soluble, right? Okay. So in water, our sodium acetate, we know it's a strong electrolyte. It 100% dissociates into our sodium ion and our acetate ion. One way arrow, 100% dissociation. We do not have any more of our molecular form, all right? We have all acetate ion, right? And then the sodium ions, that's what we've got going in solution. All right, so why? Why do they add this, um, this salt, all right? It's added in order to give a higher concentration of this conjugate base. The weak acid alone isn't going to have a high enough concentration of that conjugate base. Let's recall what we said earlier about weak acids. Okay, So this is acetic acid. It's not one of our six strong acids. Right? It's weak. What do we know about weak acids? Well, when they're placed in water, we get an acid-base reaction. Our acetic acid is going to donate a proton. Our water acts as the base and accepts a proton. And we are going to see some ionization. We're going to see some conjugate base forming, some acetate ion, and some hydronium ion. Definition of a weak acid. Right. It does not ionize completely. It is not 100% ionization. That's what this means. We only see a small amount of our acetate ion and our hydronium ion. Most remains in this form. So if we were to rely on the acetic acid alone, we're not going to have a huge concentration of this acetate ion. By adding in our salt up here, which ionizes 100%, 100%, right? Ionization, one, zero, zero percent, okay? What have we done? We've increased the concentration from low, which is what we have here, right, to a large amount. Now we're going to have a large amount of our acid. And because we've got this salt of our conjugate base there, right, we're going to end up with a large amount of our acetate ion. All right, so that's how we end up, as we said, usually we have an equal amount of these two things, okay? All righty. Okay, so function of the weak acid in a buffer, right? Two components in a buffer, the weak acid and the salt of the conjugate base. So what does the weak acid component do? Oop. The function of the weak acid in a buffer is to neutralize a base. Acids, we saw in reactions, right, will neutralize a base. The acetate ion produced adds to the available store of acetate. So let's write an equation for what we just said. So our acetic acid component in our buffer is going to react with any added base. Neutralization reaction right? Our base is going to accept the proton from our acid. We're going to end up with water 
and we're going to end up with the acetate anion. Lo and behold, what's happened? Our base is gone, right? We end up with water, which is neutral. So that's how the pH stays at 7. Acetic acid reacts with the base. We end up with acetate ion and water. Neutralization reaction. All right, pictorial. Okay, pictures always help. So we see our buffer. Our buffer has two components equal, right? The uh, acetic acid, the weak acid, and its conjugate base, right? And what did we add? We added base to it. When we add base to it, okay, the acid reacts with the base and its concentration goes down while the concentration of our acetate ion increases. Okay. All right. So the second component in the buffer is the conjugate base. So what's it there for? Why do we need it? Well, the function of that acetate anion is to neutralize any acids that um, are introduced to the buffer in the form of acids, okay? To neutralize H3O plus from any acids. The acetic acid that we're going to get out of this reaction just adds to the stockpile of acetic acid, which can react with any added base. So here is what our conjugate base, our salt of our weak acid does. Okay, here's our acetate anion. It is there to scarf up any hydronium ion that comes from from acids that are added. All right, so this is a base, right? Okay, it is going to accept a proton from our acid. Our acid's gonna donate it. What are we going to get as a product? We are going to end up with acetic acid and water. It's a neutralization reaction. Acid and base gives us water right okay acetate anion acid acetic acid and water pictorial there it is there is our original buffer equal quantities of our weak acid and its conjugate base we add acid to it this time and who reacts our conjugate base, all right? Acid-base reaction and concentration of that acetate anion goes down because it reacted and up goes the concentration of our acetic acid. So it's all ready for any more base that might be added. All right, let's put it all together. Let's summarize what we have seen regarding buffers. So a buffer. A buffer is typically composed of equal quantities of a weak acid such as acetic acid, okay, and its conjugate base as a salt, all right. So equal quantities we're seeing here. What does a buffer do? Well it resists changes in pH when we either add acid or base. So let's see what happens when we add base to the solution. We're going to get an acid-base reaction, an acid-base neutralization. Hydroxide is a base, acetic acid is the acid. The two are going to react. When these two react, the quantity of acetic acid is going to go down quantity of acetate ion is going to increase okay and it neutralizes the solution the pH stays the same when we add acid 
we're going to get an acid-base reaction, acid-base neutralization. Our acid, our H3O plus, is going to react with the base, the conjugate base. When it reacts, this quantity is going to go down, this is going to go up, and the pH is going to remain the same. All right, so the components are there to give you an acid-base neutralization reaction upon the addition of base or upon the addition of acid. Let's summarize in words. Buffer action occurs as the weak acid, as we said, here it is, here's the weak acid in the buffer, neutralizes any added base. And the conjugate base, the acetate anion in this particular one in our buffer, neutralizes any added acid. As a result, the pH of the solution is maintained either with the addition of base or with the addition of acid. All right, we're almost done here. We're going to end uh, this particular PowerPoint by giving you a little bit of a practice problem. Uh, we'll call it buffer practice and uh, see if you have mastered one very vital concept uh, regarding buffers. Um, which combination or combinations, so there could be more than one answer here, make a buffer solution? And here we're seeing four different combinations. Right? So in order to answer this, you have to really have mastered the concept of what is a buffer solution made up of. All right, so remember what we said, a buffer solution is composed usually of equal quantities of a weak acid and the salt of its conjugate base. Or sometimes, as we said, a weak base and the salt of its conjugate acid. All right, so it's either of those. So you're looking for, for either of those. So you're going to go through and, um, and check things out here. All right. So we have the first combination, HCl and uh, KCl, okay? H2CO3 and NaHCO3. Uh, phosphoric acid and NaCl. And then our last one, acetic acid and potassium acetate, okay? So give it a little bit of thought. Uh, anything um, sticking out at you right here? All right. Go through your notes. All right. Figure out who's uh, we, we're looking for a weak acid, right? And its conjugate base. So these all seem to be acids. So we can throw out. We're not looking for a weak base. All right, and it's conjugate acid. Every single one of these is an acid, if you notice. Okay, so now all you have to do is um, determine, well, who's the weak ones? All right, so remember what we said back in our part one in this chapter, right? If you know your six strong acids, okay, if it's not one of those, then it's weak. Okay, all right, so let's reveal our answer here. Okay. Solution B. Okay, B is in fact a buffer because we have a weak acid, it is not one of our six strong ones. And we have, if we draw its conjugate base, right, we're going to remove a proton here, so it'll have a negative charge so that's bicarbonate and this is sodium bicarbonate so we have a weak acid and its salt so b is um, d is also right 
should recognize this one as we were reading it. This is acetic acid. We used that in our example. The salt is a little bit different. It's the potassium salt. All right, so we have a weak acid. It's not one of our six strongs. And the salt of its conjugate base. Okay, and none of the other ones. All right, that's it. Okay, so um, make sure that you read the chapter, read these sections. It's not everything. We're eliminating a lot of the math and uh, problems, practice problems. I can't stress that enough. All right. And that's the end of our chapter 10.